Welcome to another episode of Travel Stories with Mosh podcast, the first travel podcast in the Middle East. If you love the world around you and you love exploring different landscapes, cultures, cuisines and cities, then you are in the right place because here every week I'll be talking to an incredible travel enthusiast who will take us on a fascinating journey around the world by sharing their travel stories. Today's very adventurous traveler is Sean Burgess. Sean has been traveling around the world since he was a teenager. And after working in the corporate world for many years, he finally decided to pursue his true passion, that of adventure, by launching summit expeditions here in Dubai. Today, Sean travels around the world and goes on mountain adventures with some very inspiring people. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today, Sean. It's so very exciting to have you. And I am looking forward to going on some crazy adventures with you. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much for having me, Mosh. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. So, you know, of course, I introduced uh, you as an adventurer mm. and uh, you do and you're the Kilimanjaro guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, I yeah. remember <laughs> the first time I called you, you said, I'm the Kilimanjaro guy. And I'm like, <laughs> how many times has he been there? <laughs> but we'll get to that. We'll yeah. we'll talk about that. What I want to begin with is by talking about one of your biggest achievements in life, okay. which is the two Guinness world records that you hold. Yes. Talk to me about those. Yeah. So uh, two years ago, I um, set myself the goal of breaking the Guinness World Record for mm -hmm. the fastest crossing of the UAE by foot. Mm -hmm. So I started off um, on the Saudi border mm -hmm. and I literally followed the E for um, the Sheikh Zayed Road all the way from the Saudi border all the way up to um, Iraq and then across to Fajera. So it was about wow. 630, 640 kilometers. All by foot. All by foot. So I had a support team with me. Uh, I had seven days to do it. That's the, the target that Guinness set me. Mm -hmm. And I finished in six days, 21 hours, and I think it's 17 minutes. And you still hold that record? Yes, I do. Yeah. A, a few people have attempted it, but mm -hmm. at the moment, uh, I am still the holder of that record. So, Amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I know. Yeah. You know, so of course we cannot not talk about Kilimanjaro. Okay. I'm sure it's going to pop up a <laughs> lot yes. during the podcast, but... You know, for someone who's, it's almost also very intimidating, mm. right? For somebody who's not been there or not very adventurous, if yeah. I can say that. Uh, but how hard is the journey mm. there? You know, how difficult does it go to even plan a trip to yeah. Kilimanjaro and do the trek? Yeah, so it completely depends on the operator that you choose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm very, very proud of what Summit Expeditions does. We are a premium operator. We are homegrown here in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And our kind of USP is we hold somebody's hand from the moment that they book or even pre-booking. We, mm. we do a lot of coffees and chatting to people about it before they book. From the moment that they come on board with us, we hold their hand throughout the entire entire pre-travel during the trek and then and then afterwards so it means making sure that people have got their kit we do in-person kit checks we then do outdoor hiking so we pet take people for training hikes up in the mountains and in, that's all part of the program all, all part of the program okay. it's all free of charge it's all okay. part of what we build into the package yeah. And so by the time that they've even set foot on Kilimanjaro, mm -hmm. we know that they've got all the right kits, they've done the right training, they know that they're taking Diamox, they know that they've got all of the pharmaceuticals that they might need. So we have the largest support chain on the mountain. On summit night, we have a one-to-one -one ratio. So everyone's got their own guide or assistant guide or team leader like myself. Mm -hmm. And we're one of the very few companies in the world now that offer a expedition leader. So for us, um, you know, with a 99% summit success rate, we are the most successful company operating on there. And it is because of the huge support we mm -hmm. offer. On a physical level, Mm. Do people need to be like properly fit or for this particular trek? Because that's what they say, right? You have no, altitude sickness, you have not. all of this. No, no, absolutely not. And I tell you what, the most important thing, I know it sounds a so bit... So that's just a wrong conception it that's is out there. completely wrong. It okay. is a, a long walk. Mostly it is a mental game. Mm. And I say this to everyone, It is, and it's a bit corny. It's not about the altitude, it's about the attitude. So, so how many times have you been there, Mr. Kilimanjaro? Oh, so it's over a dozen now. I do probably <laughs> Whoa, five, or, five or six really? a year. Next year already... You I've, do five or six a year? Yeah, so next oh year already God. I've got eight or nine trips up Kilimanjaro next year. So Kilimanjaro, And you never get bored. I never do. And the reason I love Kilimanjaro is because the feeling of seeing somebody get to the top of Kilimanjaro and walk up to that sign and touch it at 5,895 meters. And the emotion that comes out, because for most people, this is their only 
bucket list challenge and it'll be the hardest thing they ever do. Mm. I get to be a part of that part of their life for over a hundred people every year. That's a very, very special part of, of somebody's course. life that I get to enjoy. Yeah. Selfishly, I get to be a part of that amazing memory. Mm. So for me, I would do that. It's special for uh, you. Absolutely. You know, if I could be doing 10 Kilimanjaro trips a year, we take between eight and 12 people in a group and I get to see, you know, what's that? 120 people, 100, 120 people every year reach the summit of Kilimanjaro. That's an incredible experience for me. And that's, that's why I love so my job. That's so amazing. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So now for to begin the first question of yep. the podcast, finally, <laughs> yes. where are you taking us on a journey today? I think it makes sense, Kilimanjaro. Okay. You know, I, thought, I was I, hoping, <laughs> yeah, great. I thought about it but because, you know, I was lucky enough when I was younger to travel a lot. I remember one of my first trips, my my mum took me to Botswana, which mm. was quite unusual. And we mm. went on a helicopter safari and we, you know, I remember sitting around a campfire and shining a light at night and seeing all these eyes of the hyenas around us. And mm -hmm. that was an incredible memory, yeah. like scary, but incredible yeah. memory. Um, my dad was a film producer, so I got to travel around the world with him a lot. And there's all these different things I could mm -hmm. talk about, but Kilimanjaro, I just absolutely love that mountain for everything that it is. It's a beautiful mountain. It's epic because you get higher. It's a volcano. So you've got all the dust. You've got these incredible uh, structures like lava tower. It's a bucket list for many people. It's the hardest thing they'll ever do. And for me, being a part of that, as, as I've spoken about, being a part of that journey for people is just incredible. And I love Tanzania. The Tanzanian people are incredibly friendly. Mm -hmm. It's a safe country. It's easy to get to. So for me, it's got to be Kilimanjaro because it's a lovely nine day itinerary. You fly in, you've then got seven days on this incredible mountain. You, The routes that we do come from the Southwest. So you then travel around the mountain, around kind of the uh, sort of at about 3,500 to 4,500 meters. You go around, 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 and then you go on summit night and then you come back down. Mm -hmm. And then the nicest shower Hour, and the nicest cold drink you will ever have is mm -hmm. when you come down off to Kilimanjaro if you're not showering for seven days wow. and you stand in the shower in the hotel and yeah. you think about what you've just been through and I remember that feeling seven years ago when I did it on my own and I just I'll never forget that because that was the turning point in my life of there is more than me sitting in an office at a desk being slightly unhappy slightly unfulfilled wanting more and now I get to do that adventure you know, 10 times a year with a hundred plus people. It's incredible. And Kilimanjaro did that to you. It did. It, it absolutely did. That's I, the beauty of traveling, isn't it? You it just, really you just is. discover yourself so much more than just going somewhere and absolutely. coming back and Hey, I, I had a trip like Kilimanjaro is so special to you in that absolutely. sense. Absolutely. So tell me, which is the most, like you've been there so many times now, yes. so you pretty much know your way, like you know, the <laughs> yeah. back of your hand. So which is the most beautiful or the most interesting part of the trek when you're climbing the mountain? Oh, so the first day you're going through the rainforest. Mm -hmm. So that's quite unusual for us here, especially people in Dubai who've never been in a, a forest situation, a rainforest. You know, you see deserts all the time and then mm. suddenly you're in and you're seeing Colobus monkeys or blue monkeys and, and just trees that are come canopies over you. Mm. But it's still as forest. You haven't got great uh, views out. Um, the second day you're coming through kind of the scrubland and the savanna. And then the third day you go up to Lava Tower at four and a half. It's the fourth day which I love, not necessarily because the views are incredible, but it's the Branco wall. So it's the only part, and it's a part that people get a little bit scared of, uh -huh. but it's also the most exhilarating part mm -hmm. because the, it's the only time on the mountain where you're kind of scrambling a little bit up the side of a, a rocky face. It's they're absolutely safe, there's no danger, but it, it's exhilarating. Mm. When you get to the top of that, you stand on this kind of shelf and one side is you're looking at over the plains of, of Tanzania and the other side, and normally because we get there in the morning, you see Kilimanjaro behind you and it's clear as day, there's no clouds. And wow. it's this first moment that people realize what an incredible thing they're doing because they've been so focused on putting one step in front of the other, looking up sort of, you've got trees and you've got a bit of scrub land and you can't really see it all. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that you suddenly see where you are and you see Kilimanjaro, you can see the summit where you're going to in a few days time. That way you've, you're above the clouds and it's that just, and I think at that point, if I know people can get to there and they're fine, I'm like, you're gonna make it. So. Day four is the best day for me. Day four is the best day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Sean, which is the best part of the year? Which is the best time, rather, mm. to go to Kilimanjaro? So, Tanzania has got two rainy seasons, mm. one long and one short. Mm. And then in between those, it's got its long, dry seasons. One long, dry season, one short. So, the best times are June's lovely, September's lovely, and January and February are lovely. So, there are quite a few times oh, of the yeah, year absolutely. that you can go, right? Yeah. So, you know, you've been traveling around since you were a teenager, yep. like we know. But, you know, growing up, do you remember any particular place that kind of made you realize that you love travel? Or was it a person or was it an incident? What was it that made you realize this love for adventure, love for places? 
<laughs> what is it that happened? Um, after school, when I was in my late teens, I actually left and went to China. And I lived in China for a year where I taught alone? a little bit of English and I played a bit of rugby. And, and did that, you do that alone? Yes. Yeah. Oh. So I got on a plane at 18 years old, flew over to China and, and lived there for a year. And that was, again, an experience of something so foreign to mm -hmm. where I'd, I'd grown up in you know i went to a boarding school in in the uk mm. you can't really get any different than living in the outskirts of beijing in this tiny student flat with some other teachers from yeah, around the world yeah. and teaching in a local kindergarten where they'd never seen a white person before so was it china for you then the just experiences in so china from china i then traveled down through southeast asia and just backpacked through there and then i went to japan with my dad and that is by far my favorite country in the world I to travel Japan. in. I love Japan, yeah, yeah. Absolutely love it. And the it. people are so nice. So friendly, They're so, so nice, and it, the language is kind of a problem because everyone yeah. doesn't speak English, yeah. but, you know, if you're asking, like, everyone's so busy, right? They're all on their gadgets <laughs> yeah. and they're walking, and, uh, but if you're lost and you ask someone, yep. like, how do I get to whatever, that yeah. actually, because they can't explain it to you, they'll actually hold your hand and actually yeah. show you or sometimes <laughs> even walk you there. I'm like, yeah. you're so nice, you know? know? And I you know. don't find people like that in the world nowadays. So no. I think Japan is very refreshing yes, in, in many absolutely. ways. Yeah. And because it isn't tourist focused, yeah. as you said, they don't, they're not speaking English to get yeah. the tourists in. Yeah. It doesn't feel like you're constantly being hassled or you just kind of exist there mm. alongside mm. their day-to-day -day lives. And, and I love that. Yeah, it feels I, I love way it. more authentic. And everything's efficient. Everything's clean. The yeah. food's the amazing. Food. Oh, my Yes, the culture is yes, incredible. Yes, everything, yeah. everything. And it's just genuinely nice people. Oh, absolutely. That's yeah, what makes I it even it. special. Yeah. So, you know, the next question, mm. I think I already know the answer, um, <laughs> yes. but I will still ask you, which is your favorite destination and why? I did think about Paris. I love Paris and yeah. Paris. I love because of the memories that I have. So we're not even wife. counting Kilimanjaro here because, you know, that's we like, were, yeah, yeah. That, we were <laughs> that, about, yeah. About that. Kilimanjaro yeah. is, is a different beast. It's not like I love Kilimanjaro and I do two, three months a year, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't necessarily live there. I could live in Japan and yeah. I could live in Paris. And Paris has got so many fond memories because it's where my wife and I fell in love because we were only together for two months before. And it's so interesting that you're saying Paris because nowadays not very many people talk about Paris fondly. No, I know. You know? It's a yeah. little bit like a lot of Western Europe's become. Like London, yeah. again, people have, you know, those images of what London was maybe 15 years ago. Yeah. Every, now it's just expensive and it's, you know, it's fast cars and it's this and it's not like the authentic London that most people probably grew up loving and maybe you know we haven't been to Paris in or oh, four or five years so mm -hmm. maybe it has changed and maybe when we go there it will be different but for us I've just got so many fond memories and it's not the tourist we didn't really do the tourist stuff it was just going and finding a nice little cafe mm -hmm. in one of the um little you know, alleys in, little alleys yeah. in, in yeah. one of like the 15th 16th Arrondissement. like it's finding one of those having a coffee or having mm. a glass of wine mm. together watching the world go by mm. you know be going and sitting in yeah. an alleyway or yeah. a, a small side yeah. street in paris and finding a cafe and yeah. sitting with the locals and they're all smoking having their wine you're in coffee and yeah. a croissant and yeah. that is what we love yeah it's and the culture it's just so it different is. i think you know paris has also got a lot of bad press recently mm. but um for me paris has been special because if yeah. you know where to go exactly. those little alleys and those yeah. you know follow the locals or just go to a little village just the outskirts of Paris so much Definitely. to do and it is truly a city of love you yes. know it is so beautiful absolutely I totally agree. everywhere yeah. you look yeah absolutely yeah. so yeah. I say Paris yeah okay great so you know when you think about all the travels that you've mm. done and so much happens you know so many things happen when you're traveling mm. but has there been a place that you don't kind of fancy going back to or any mm. incident that has happened that don't kind of bring fond memories yeah so a few years ago frankie and i went to mauritius mm. and i'm not saying and this is i'll, I'll explain because we did a package deal mm. um through a uk company and we obviously the flights got there transfers got there got stuck mm. at a hotel mm. with a package deal mm. all inclusive and it rained the entire week and we got stuck in this yeah stuck in the hotel for the entire time and that was the worst holiday. And I'm not saying that's because Mauritius is an incredible, yeah, beautiful yeah, place. Yeah. It's because we did it badly. No, it's not that we'll never go back to Mauritius. Mm. It's that we'll never do that kind of holiday yeah. again, that package yeah. deal, yeah. all inclusive. No, not for us. So you will surely go back, but the next time you go, you know what not to do. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk about your hidden gem. Like, what is your hidden gem? Oh, so I was in Uganda 
three or four months ago doing a recce for mm -hmm. somebody's exhibition. So next year we've got this incredible um, gorilla and chimp gorilla trekking and chimpanzee habituation trip to Uganda. Oh my god! Eight days over there. You spend one day with the uh, chimpanzees. You do two days of safari. You mm -hmm. then do a uh, bicycle tour and canoeing. And then on one of the last days you do gorilla trekking. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky enough to go and recce that a few months ago. And I spent seven days in, in Uganda. And it wasn't the gorilla trekking was amazing, but that's a, a given, you know, everyone knows that's going to mm. be amazing. But what was a hidden gem for me was I actually arranged it with our country manager over there. And he said, look, I'm going to send you to this little resort that's a resort, you know, it's a few lodges mm. um, in the southwest of the country on the border of Congo and Rwanda. And I'm mm. just going to send you down there. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. So I went all the way down there. Um, it took about six hours drive, got there. And it was absolutely incredible. There's this beautiful lake, it's called Lake Chahafi, and it borders with Congo sort of over there, but the border with Rwanda. And it was the first time that I've ever trespassed into a country because when I got to the, the lodge, and it's again, it's a few straw huts, but beautiful sort of luxury straw huts with four poster beds and air con and all the luxuries. The guy was like, do you want to uh, go to Rwanda? And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, okay. So we walked 10 minutes and walked into Rwanda and walked in there and, and we're around that part of the country. Oh, Came back, got into a little uh, canoe and then canoed across this lake as the sun was setting. And... I just never ever expected to be in a situation where I was staying in kind of these luxury lodges with four poster beds, having a, a local, um, I can't remember what the beer was called over there, but also having walked through this little village into another country mm -hmm. that was, you know, there's no border patrol, there's no passports, there's no anything. None of that. None of that because people work on either side. So people are just walking across all the time oh. and the tribe that's there has been there for and hundreds of- And what's the security of, situation none, there? absolutely none. The people can just walk in and out across. And it's the, safe. And, and it's, it's safe, absolutely just normal. safe. No, there's no trouble whatsoever. And they were like, well, look, the tribes here have been, roaming these lands for hundreds of years it was only maybe 50 years ago that the lines were drawn saying that this is uganda this is rwanda mm -hmm. and everyone just went well no we're going to ignore that because we've been this these are our lands for mm -hmm. years so yeah. yeah you can just walk in and out of this country there's yeah. beautiful going across this lake you had the some extinct volcanoes on one side and I, I didn't know what to expect with uganda in general and i was blown away by its beauty and it was the only country that i've ever been to where where genuinely every person said thank you so much for coming to our country in a oh, in a very so nice. genuine way yeah. not in a he's a tour guide and yeah. he says it because he feels he has yeah. to you would be anywhere and i remember i was they climbing actually there mean as well. it they, they mean say it. that i was climbing mount stanley which is the third highest mountain in africa and it's the highest mountain in uh, uganda and it, it borders the Congo. And I remember that I just met three other Ugandan guys who were climbing. So they mm. weren't tour guides, they weren't there, but mm. they genuinely liked the fact that I was there and supporting them and bringing yeah. people to their country. I've never had that before in any country I've ever ever been to. And That's so beautiful. I came back from Uganda just blown away by its beauty, its quality for the price, although the gorilla trekking is expensive. That's yeah. the only bit, but the price you pay is almost a thousand dollars for the permits alone, mm. just to go and spend one hour with the gorillas. Per person? Per person. Okay. But what you see is what they build around the gorillas and the protection that they have, the rangers and the guides and the trackers. Mm. They build this entire infrastructure around protecting these incredible animals because there's only about a thousand left in the world. Yeah. So so that's between Uganda and Rwanda, the gorillas divided between? So I think there's over half of them are in Uganda mm. in two forests. And then there's some in... Rwanda, there are some. I don't know if there's any in the Congo. There's mm. definitely some in Rwanda, but they're kind of in that area. Mm. And what they do is they've habituated almost half of them in Uganda, but they leave other families because they're all, all different families. Mm -hmm. They leave some of the families alone. And I asked them why. I said, surely, you know, from a business point of view, you'd want to habituate all of them and then yeah. you can get more people here. Yeah. And they said no, because one, we want to keep it uh, small and controllable and not have too many people come down here, not have too much uh, people going through the forests and, and messing it up. I said, also, we're very concerned about a COVID situation happening, oh, somebody okay. bringing it in right. and then wiping out all the all the oh, gorillas. Yeah. So we actually leave them there because if something did happen, it only wipes out, and I know it sounds horrendous, but yeah, wipes yeah. out half of them. And at least we've got others there that are protecting the species. But they have to be careful. Oh, absolutely. With, yeah, yeah. And so when you see that, you kind of then start to think about, okay, the, the money that you're spending is not going into some politician's back pocket mm. there. It is going into the protection of these and animals. preservation of these animals. Absolutely. So you would say Uganda is your My hidden, hidden gem. gem. At the moment because yeah. 
I didn't expect it. And I, it's absolutely safe to go to I, Uganda. You just probably need a bit of planning, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, like uh, you would do for any other country. Absolutely. Yeah. On the way back from the gorillas, you can stop at the equator and stand in between the northern and southern hemispheres. Yeah. And it's quite interesting. Also experience. I love it. Uganda's okay. amazing. And easy to get into. Online visa application. Great. You need a yellow fever vaccination, but that's all. Yeah, Uganda. So go, go to my, Uganda. My hidden gem. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about food. Are you a foodie? <laughs> so I'm I'm not unfortunately because I, I I spend so much time focusing on health and fitness and no I mean it could be good food oh, it could be healthy food doesn't really matter because my question to you would okay. be if you can travel around the world in one day okay. where would you like to have breakfast lunch and dinner I would go Bali for breakfast mm -hmm. so I'd wake up and have poached eggs and avocado on toast with a acai smoothie and a nice juice or something in Bali. And mm -hmm. more because of the surroundings, you know, there's a few cafes that we we stay at when we're in, because I love going to Bali. And mm -hmm. when we go there- You have your favorites. Yeah, have, yeah. Have, I think uh, one of my favorites called Watercress and you look out over the uh, paddy fields and you've, and it's just being there and being mm. chilled and the quality of the food is so high. So it's mm. simple food, but it's high quality food, yeah. which is yeah. what I love. Yeah. So I'd say Bali in the morning, uh, lunch in, Paris, and then evening, Tokyo, probably having sushi um, in one of the crazy sushi bars there yeah. and then yeah. going for a few drinks afterwards in, in the uh, nightlife era. Yeah, yeah I think that's fun. probably it. Bali, Paris and uh, yeah, Tokyo. Okay, that, that sounds really <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Not it's too like, bad. But what about Dubai? Because obviously we know we're all spoiled for choice over yeah. here and there's so much you can have all the cuisines that yes. you want to. So which are your favorite places in Dubai for breakfast, lunch and dinner? Oh my God, I'm going to be the most disappointing person. I never eat out. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I think because I travel so much, I when I'm home, I try and get into a really strict routine yeah. because I'm probably away for three to four months of the year. So is year. it home, home, home? Yeah, it is, it is. I, <laughs> yeah? I do. I have a, a meal delivery service where I get my breakfast, lunch and delivered oh, every really? day. Yeah, oh really? So where does your food come from? Uh, fuel up. So okay. I get Fuel Up, who do my food, they deliver it. But, okay, so uh, Sean's <laughs> breakfast, lunch and dinner is Fuel Up. It's is getting a lot of publicity <laughs> oh, on the podcast yeah, today. Yeah. So because, you know, we know what you're all about now. Yeah. You're not about food, no. especially when it's... Let's talk about something more exciting, which is up your alley. Okay. Um, experiences. Okay. So in the UAE mm. or Dubai, which is your favorite experience in terms of outdoors? Okay. Or if people want to come here or people who are listening yep. and they want to do something which is exciting and a great experience, okay. what would you recommend? Okay, I'm going to, like there's, there's obviously loads of stuff we can do mm. here and I could talk about the hikes and things like that, mm. which are obviously amazing. If people do want to get out, please go and do a hike. We've got mm. some beautiful mountains here. Um, I love the cultural center that's mm -hmm. in Deira, uh, in the port area. And you can go there and you can talk to an Emirati. I think that that's something that should be mandatory for people to do when they come here, just to respect the local cultures. You know, I'm sick of walking into the mall and seeing people in bikinis and a thong, mm. basically, is what's mm. happening now. It's mm. ridiculous. Mm. And I love the idea. And it's brilliant. I don't know if you've ever done it, but we always send family. When they first come here, they go and do this cultural morning, or you can do a lunch at the cultural center. And it's hosted by an Emirati woman, an Emirati man. Mm. And they say, you can ask us anything, any question. Is that the Bastakia area? I think it is, by yeah. the port. Yeah. Yes, by the old, yeah, the old center. And it's... It's not expensive at all. You get a lovely Emirati meal included and you can go and talk to them and you can ask any question about anything and mm. really anything. You can mm. talk to them mm. about alcohol and, and drugs and divorce and, and the way that uh, the perception of the UAE is, is. from outside. Yeah. And they are completely honest. There's nothing shut off and they've mm. been given permission to talk openly. Mm. And, I, and I absolutely love that. So that's a lovely experience I think people should do. Mm. But it's my, the Heritage Express. Uh, that, that's it, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. But I think my favorite experience I'd like to take people to, because it is so bizarre, is the Falcon Hospital in Abu Dhabi. What? <laughs> so you can go and do a yeah, tour of the yeah. Falcon Hospital in yeah. Abu Dhabi. And I love it because it nobody knows about it. It's They do these tiny little tours. And so okay. the tours have only got three or four people in it. But it is so genuine because it's not put on. It's not created for tourists. It mm. is legitimately the Falcon Hospital for the Emiratis to look after their Falcons. Oh. And it's absolutely amazing because when you go there, you can literally sit in the waiting room and you'll sit around and there'll be five or six local guys there with their falcons on their arm and they are so proud of these incredible birds and they'll talk to you about it and they'll take the, the hood off and they'll talk about the bird and they'll talk about why it's there today. And the whole tour is around 
how these guys bring their falcons in essentially for a service. So they bring them in, they fix any broken feathers, they fix, they cut their nails, they do this, they make sure their eyes and everything's good. It's basically a, a service for your falcon. I've never heard of it's this. It's incredible. It's so interesting. It's in, so the yeah. Falcon Hospital the in Falcon Abu Dhabi in is Abu Dhabi. a great experience, right, you would say. Yeah, absolutely. It's just okay. incredible. Again, inexpensive compared to what you would pay. Mm. And something that you haven't seen or it's just and not... Nobody knows about it. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it, for people who are admired, especially people who love animals, but even if you just want something that is unique to and do. different and unique to the region also absolutely yeah, yeah. Oh, and, that's and, brilliant and a genuine that's amazing. experience because you honestly get to interact with with local emiratis with and see a, the falcons as well with falcons yeah. in a pastime that again is traditional to this this area right and that's what i love about it. and then you you Beautiful. take them to where they've been looked after there's some who are very sick so you then take them there you can sometimes if you get there at the right time see them doing an operation one of the falcons oh they my literally god will knock them out spread their wings out and they'll be like this is what we're doing we're taking oh. this wing out they then put an artificial feather in if they've got a broken feather yeah they'll put that in they've got some owls there so you can and you can put have an owl on your your wrist oh my god it's just oh so that's fun. brilliant yeah. that really is brilliant okay yeah. so obviously you do yeah. kilimanjaro you do all these adventures yes. but i'm sure there are some mountains left for you now so what's <laughs> yeah, what's just... next in travel for you yes yeah, so we're doing back i've never never done that so as my shan That'll be fun. And then next year I'm climbing Mount Kenya for the first time, which mm. will be a fun mountain to do. I wish you all the best. <laughs> Thank and you very I much. really, really hope you get to do what you want to do in yeah. terms of travel and exploration and adventure right. and all of that. It's great. Thank you so much, Brilliant. Sean. Thank you. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there and your phone's going to start ringing very <laughs> soon. Uh, yes. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people will get in touch with you. And I hope a lot of people get in touch with you yes. and go on these expeditions with you. So thank you so much for Fantastic. joining us on this podcast today. Thank you. Mosh. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. I hope our conversations have fueled your wanderlust and inspired you to explore the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And until next time, safe travels and keep exploring. Music